So it was 1972, pre-Roe v. Wade, but abortion, just by chance and luck, it was legal in New York State. And then also Lucky Mark was working on an OB um, rotation in medical school, so he asked his teacher about the fact that I was pregnant and we didn't want the pregnancy. And so he was able to get, um, get that particular physician was able to get me taken care of. Um, so we've been, I think I was eight weeks pregnant. But I just wanted to tell you the social and political situation is so different than than it is now. There was we made decisions based on the, what our lives needed or could and couldn't handle. You know, um, we were really young. We were getting married really before we wanted to. We I hadn't finished my education. Mark was way early in his education, and um, I mean I suppose our parents would have chipped in to help us live. You know, um, but. We, we, and we also knew that we were two, we were like two children, we always say that. Our families had lots of problems and we weren't sure we ever wanted to have a child because we thought we don't want to replicate some of the stuff that we've been through. So that was my, my point to you, is just that it was so different then. And I feel for people now because there's so much shame and there's, there's so many people telling you, you know, you're bad or you're, you know, making you feel guilty, it seems to me, because you get pregnant and you don't want a child. And it's really nobody's <coughs> damn business. I mean, you everybody has to make their own decision. And everybody's life is so completely different that um, we should just be able to make those decisions. So that was really what I wanted to yeah, say. Yeah, that's sort of our life. Our life is about stories, right? We all have our story. And so what I'm going to do is talk about a little bit about my story, not very much, but about the stories of my patients together. Um, so, well, part of the story too is that because I had that pregnant uh, abortion, you felt grateful to. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the reasons why I wound up doing what I did. But at any rate, I worked on um, doing general OBGYN for 30 years, doing babies, and um, doing general stuff, um, taking care of women, but one of, the, are there, one of the things that women often ask me right away is, why did you become an OBGYN doctor since you were a man? And there are two things, uh, that, you know, one, well, a couple. One is that I felt happy, um, it was a happy specialty compared to medicine, so for even babies, and it was positive. Um, and the other, I think, really had to do, looking retrospectively, had a lot to do with my mother. Because um, I had a very difficult relationship with my father, which is a whole other story. But my mother loved me um, unconditionally and supported me um, always. And I think that that brought me closer to women um, and actually made me, uh, I mean, I had girls who were friends in high school and junior high school well before I had girlfriends. So it was sort of it, was, it sort of felt comfortable for me. So that's my story. Um, so what happened was after 30 years in Cooperstown um, doing a regular OBGYN, uh, the conditions there for doing abortions were um, terrible and people said nasty things to my patients. And I started doing abortions. Oh, okay. Well, for instance, there was a 16-year-old who was scared shitless um, about speaking. But uh, he was you know, really just terrified. And saying, who wouldn't be, right, at 16 and having an abortion and in the prep area? And so we said, well, give her some sedation. And so we brought her into the operating room, and she was still just terrified. Finally got her to sleep, did this procedure, came back, looked at the order, order for sedation was given, was, was there, not given, said to the nurse, how come you didn't give her this verset, it's called, it was like a valium or something. And she said, oh, I was busy, and besides, I have no sympathy for women who get themselves in this situation. And so that was one of my uh, pivotal experiences. And I guess one of the things is that it's the stories that got to me, honestly. The stories of women, uh, the stories of women of your demographic, primarily. And that's why I think it means so much to, to have 
this opportunity to speak to you about the stories I experienced in 40 years of, in, and in the last 12 years of Planned Parenthood taking care of women your age primarily um, because you're the people that are were important to me um, for those years and uh, still important to me um, even though I retired. Um, and you're the people who do this. <laughs> <laughs> we do this. This is nothing. You've been married. Well, never mind. <laughs> 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 you guys are the people who are going to move forward. You, you know, are, and, and you the can. The politics and the social. And you, you will. And like I was one person, uh, and I made a decision, and I did 14,000 abortions in 12 years. So. You know, one person can make a big difference, um, and uh, and you know, it was difficult in many ways. And after 12 years, I really had to stop. But you know, I think we're both inspired by the current shitstorm, basically, um, to uh, to do something. And so this is what I want to do. What we want to do. Um, so anyway, that's what that's my work history. Um, and I'd like to now play a two-minute clip. Um, from, this is a clip from um, a guy. <coughs> um, oops. Okay, good. Um, and there's some audio before the, the video comes. And this is uh, a, a guy from a man from pro-life Wisconsin testifying before the Wisconsin legislature. Um, so, here we go. Well, I'll explain our position. Certainly with hormonal contraceptives, we oppose them. Because the hormonal contraceptives, whether it's the birth control pill, the morning after pill, uh, uh, injectables such as mineral, product, Vera, interuterine device, all of them have the same pharmacological mechanisms in that they can work, that third mechanism to block the implantation of a newly conceived child. And Therefore, because of their abortifacient the effect, we do oppose them, we oppose their use. As far as uh, barrier methods, um, condoms, spermicides, you know, diagrams, those types of things, pro life Wisconsin has always been concerned about the contraceptive mentality, the idea that has been uh, kind of sunk in, that a child is an accident, and that we elevate pregnancy to a disease status, at which we don't have to be protected at all costs, including. Um, possibly harming their health and life around the child. So I hope that answers your question. Um, I do, do you think birth control pills cause abortions? Or, yeah, well, when we're talking about the morning after pill, remember it's just a, um, a high dose of your typical birth control pill. So, yes, the, the, the pill itself. Um, it can't have an abortifacient effect. It can't act in that third way. Is there any sort of female contraceptive that that pro-life Wisconsin supports? I would say no, because I explained our concern about the contraceptive mentality. Right. So it's, yes. it's okay for a guy to take care of himself and not for a woman. Is that very much the position? No, not at all. If we, if we, if we oppose contraception. Because of the mentality of treating the child as an accident, it would apply to everyone. It's not gender based. It's, like I said, we would pose uh, barrier methods as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. It's weird because he talks about they don't want the child to be an accident. Well, without birth control, isn't the child an accident? I mean, well, this I mean, doesn't make any sense. What this, this was about a decade ago, I would say. And this is where we are nationally, of course, today. You know, I mean, with the defunding of Planned Parenthood and probably overturning Roe v. Wade, this is the kind of struggle that we face. Um, but it is not a hopeless struggle. I, I don't want, but I think it's really important to get this guy off. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, people like you, they. The, the Republicans you know, control this legislators <coughs> and there are Republican governors in a lot of states. And so this kind of person has infiltrated, especially the Midwest um, area. So I think we're somewhat insulated in New York State, but um, now. Yeah. right now. 
But anyway, so so one of the questions that I, I, I get a series of questions from uh, surprising um, sources. Um, I didn't tell her yesterday, I was speaking to this feminist of my generation, and she introduced me to a, a woman of our generation. And uh, I said, well, yeah, and I went to Planned Parenthood, and I did abortions. And she said, oh, <laughs> so it doesn't end. But so people, people, well, say, people say to me, uh, and you never know where it's coming from, right? You never know. Um, but people say to me, well, why do women have abortions when birth control is available? That's one of the questions they have. You know, they should be more responsible. Now, I don't know. And, and there's always the woman, right? It's always the woman. I have patients say all the time, I feel, I feel so irresponsible. You know, there was a man, I mean... Usually, right? <laughs> why, you know, why should, why should a woman? It really upset me. Why should a woman own that? Uh, and, um, but anyway, and getting back to the general issue is that we have an extremely efficient method of reproduction that's unique almost among mammals, and of course, um, an intense urge to reproduce. Otherwise, we wouldn't. And so that. That um, that's just the way we are, and the more abortions I did, the more I understood that this is sort of simply human biology, uh, nothing more, nothing less. But birth control, is, um, reproduction is difficult to stop in humans because it's so, because our reproductive system is so effective. So pills, you know, have a nine percent actual use failure rate first year of use and people use think, oh they were perfect. Well, you know, you forget a pill or you're late on a pill or you're taking an antibiotic and you probably all know this, but you know, you, you, you lose the effectiveness and can ovulate and then therefore can uh, conceive and of course you may not want to have a child, you may just want to have sex after all. And one of the things about I think that this guy um, Anybody want to have sex with him? But so, but people said, oh, it's very, very effective, and there are only a few methods that are really effective. Um, and you probably know, many of you know, you know, the IUD, the implant, and Depo-Provera are the really, really effective methods. So abstinence, it, you know, it is supposed to be an alternative, and obviously that's what he is talking about. And, you know, I mean, that abstinence obviously doesn't work on a population basis, but I've thought about that concept a lot, seriously. And seriously, you know, I, I know, I'm sure... Those of you who are straight or bisexual and, and are capable, therefore, of getting pregnant, um, and I'm really talking about people who are who are in relationships where where it's possible to conceive. So it's a narrowed down discussion today. But it's hard enough, isn't it, to maintain a relationship uh, with with sex? I mean, and without sex, you know, it's really hard. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody has to have sex, obviously. I mean, not everybody does, and some people it works fine with no sex. I'm not saying that, but if you look, generally speaking, it's really cruel and, and, and inappropriate, I think. Yeah, well, it's what? bullshit. I mean, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> what, what he's saying, I mean, I don't know what he actually means, because he obviously means it. I mean, everybody has sex, so what is he talking about, you know? So, I mean, he's not, I'm sure he's not abstinent, and it's not a, it's not a, I don't think it's a viable choice. So anyway, that's the thing that, um, one of the questions I get, and I'll just tell you some stories, because mm -hmm. stories are important. I took care of a 22-year-old, and she was in college, um, and she said, I'm, I'm the first person in my family um, ever to go to college, and I feel like I'm, I'm really lost it. I'm really letting me down. And I never thought I'd find myself in this situation. 
and I want to finish, I want to have an education, and I want to finish college. And it just seemed so sad. She said that she had just told her girlfriend that um, her girlfriend was having an abortion, that she was killing her baby, and she said, I'm, here I am, and I never thought I'd be here. And that was an experience that I had so often with young women that I took care of. They said, I never saw I'd be in this situation. I never do, because, you know, it's just, nobody imagines that, and nobody can understand that. I only understand it from having taken care of so many women, but nobody can understand what that's like, except the person in that, with that story. And so I'll tell you some more stories, um, and some of them, this next one is kind of fiction, almost, but it's true. Um, women, um, they say, well, why do women wait? Uh, why, do they, why don't they just have first trimester abortions, early abortions? I'm okay with early abortions, but not late abortions. And it's true. I went to 20 weeks, and doing a 20-week, of a four-and-a-half-month abortion is difficult. It's difficult for me um, emotionally. Um, it's difficult technically. I did gynecological surgery for 30 years, and it can be very challenging. But um, there are many reasons um, that women wait that women quote unquote wait. One is that some women continue to have bleeding in pregnancy and don't realize they're pregnant. Another is that they may not be particularly aware of their bodily functions. Not all women are, are understand their bodily functions that well. I think that's a small group. Um, other, also, you know, as you probably know, um, physical abuse is, often begins in pregnancy. That's often the first time that uh, an abusive relationship begins. And um, so I had a patient who's, who came in, and she had a little um, a band-aid over her pinky. And she um, said that her boyfriend uh, pulled out, took a pliers, and pulled out her fingernail with a pair of pliers. And said, I've never, I've ne he's never done anything like this before. But, and she was about 18 months pregnant, but she said, but I don't want to have this baby. And um, so, so that precipitate the pregnancy with the pulling out of the I, I, I think he was just, it was his first act of abuse, you know, and, but it was a horrible, horrible, horrible act of abuse. And um, she said, she said to me, can I, can I see my baby? And I, I said, of course you can, but you have to realize that. I'm sorry to be so graphic, but I think it's important. I think this fetus would be in pieces. And she said, she still wanted to, and she sat up, and she said, can I hold, can I hold it? And I said, of course you can hold it. I, this this beca is because I, I didn't let a woman see her, a child, a 16-year-old, see her deformed fetus when I was an intern in 1973 and she told me it was the worst thing that ever happened to her in her life and this was about six years later when she died of AIDS so I always 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 listen after that but anyway she held it and she looked and she said look oh look it's a penis it was a little boy and she looked at it and she said I'm, I'm so sorry and then she looked at me and she said thank you so I just mentioned this case because it's complicated you know and, it, and the stories are complicated. And then the other question I get is, why do women have more than one abortion? Well, people have more than one abortion because birth control doesn't always work. And people continue to have sex, and they tend to have failure rates. And it's just the way it is. It's just difficult. Um, so about a quarter of my patients were anti-abortion, or said in, in stirrups, say, I don't believe in this, but I've always been against this, but how can you do this work? You know, and once you better clean those fucking instruments before you use them on me. But, you know, and then afterwards she apologized because, you know, it's just shame, right? You know, and I don't think that a 60 or 50 year old at the time male gynecologist standing between a woman's legs and spirit in stirrups when she says something like that. Not a teachable moment, right? You know, you don't. So, um, anyway, and and also, um, 
I remember another story. It was a patient that had came for her third abortion. And she was a, a housekeeper who um, was on minimum wage. And um, I had given her birth control pills. And I, and I said, you know, you're having trouble taking the pills or uh, you know, what's going on? Is there a way that we can improve this, make things better? And she said, well, she said, my boyfriend goes through my purse every day. And when he sees that I have pills, he flushes them down the toilet. And she had pinch marks on her arms. And what I did, I talked, and I talked to her and I said, um, let's put in an IED and cut the string so he won't feel it. And that's what we did. And I said, you know, have you thought about leaving him? And I didn't, I don't believe in saying that sort of thing in a judgmental manner. Those of you who know, those of you who have been in studies, you know that there are many reasons that women don't leave, don't leave their abusers, right? I mean, that's something that you understand. But she said, well, um, I have no money. I mean, I don't have enough money to live on my own. I have no family. I have no place else to go. Um, and so the, the, I'm telling you these stories because of the complexity okay, of these issues. Of these. And so there was a, I had another patient who, who, who said, you know, my boyfriend is a protester. And I'm so glad he's not out there today because, you know, I just was really scared he'd be there. And um, so and I said, I hope, she said, I hope he can't find out. So she, we're not going to tell him, you know. That's for sure. Um, and uh, anyway, it's against the law for us to say anything. And so I was giving her her post-operative instructions, and I said, you know, you can't, you should, you shouldn't have sex for two weeks until the bleeding stops. And she said, well, my boyfriend won't accept that. He has to have sex twice a week. So, um, you know, th these are the kinds of these are the kinds of uh, stories that got to me. Five minutes. Okay, and then in the midst, of, I guess the other thing is that the reason that um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I left is that it was difficult because there were murderers, there were protesters every day, there were hundreds of uh, fire bombings and stuff over the years. There was a, we got um, curtains because a, co a guy when I just started doing more abortions was shot in his kitchen window, in kitchen, through his kitchen window. Um, and so she put curtains on her kitchen windows for the first time. She can't explain it because <laughs> they would protect us, but that's what, what we were advised to do. So, um, and, you know, professionally was isolating. Uh, people said judgmental things. People still say judgmental things. I don't really have a pro I hired an OBGYN who is quote unquote pro life. I think I'm pro life, but that's what he called it. But uh, because he was a good doctor, and he didn't threaten me. And I think the difference, there's a difference between having deeply felt um, different disagreements about <coughs> profound matters is okay, but, you know, we don't um, engage in violence uh, and, and terrorism, domestic terrorism, on the basis of that. And so that's... I never had a problem with it because I think this is a very difficult and there's a lot of ambiguity in all of this. But I think women have to come first. You have to come first. And um, there's a, I've sent to you, Mika, a thing about um, how to register to vote because you really need to vote. It makes a big difference because turnouts are very low 38% of the last midterm mm -hmm. election of eligible voters. And there's a list that you have too that about um, how to become, how to run as a candidate. Uh, and, and there are many examples of young people uh, running as candidates. So lots of times people run unopposed in, in local elections. And then there's a thing called indivisible, uh, dot org or indivisible guide, the dot org that was put together by ex-congressional aides. There are groups all over the country, and they base their strategy on um, the Tea Party, and so if you want to become active, that's an interesting organization to think about. Um, and so I probably am done. There's a lot more to say, but I want to hear what you have to say because you are the people who are important to me. 
So, yeah, we need more women legislators, you know. Yeah. And that's really important because so we can make some just women can make decisions for women instead of all those white haired old men. <coughs> Always. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Are we done? So, <laughs> <that's it. laughs> so anything, any tips we can ask? Um, either yeah, of us, anything. anything. Yeah. When there are threats of aggression, are the authorities responsible for supporting and protecting the um, protecting the people who are being threatened with aggression? I see. The question is, when there are acts of aggression, are the authorities um, active in protecting them? Yes. <laughs> you know, honestly, um, I don't know. And the reason doctors see this little little tiny moment in their patients' lives, and, and it's, um, we, we don't always know. I mean, sometimes we, you know, we network with social services and we, we, we do that. Wait, are you talking about I'm the, against the women? The, the doctors. The doctor. I'm sorry. No, no. no oh, well, we had, I always liked, to, I never liked the police growing up because we, we grew up in the 60s. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I must say, I was very glad. Our national meetings were like, uh, uh, run, were run really well by this guy who ran it like a <coughs> secret service. There were people all over with their little earphones, big people, uh, and um, they cleared every room with bomb sniffing dogs before each lecture. I never thought in med school that I would have to do that. But, um, and um, depending on the area, some people are. Uh, some people have good police, and some people have bad police that don't help. Uh, but you have a good we police. had a good we had relationship good. with the New York State. Yeah, there's a wonderful woman at the New York State Anti-Terrorism Unit, and she was great. And uh, you know, what I did is what um, all women and, and certainly um, some men, but is the most important thing for protection is. Uh, being aware of your surroundings and trusting your gut, right? I mean, that's, you know, something doesn't seem right, it's not right. And we, you know, once we were in the, the parking lot of Planned Parenthood and we got out and you started talking to me and I said, you know, we're not talking, we're going right in. I would scan the roof tops, I would look at the other parked cars, I would have my fob, my key in, you know, stay away from the protesters. Um, you, you kind of have to, it's not a constant state of fear, uh, exactly, uh, it's a constant state of awareness. There's a book called The Gift of Fear, um, which is a very upsetting book, but it is basically uh, about <coughs> that we are taught sometimes to, to think, I'm sure you've all met somebody who, you know, supposed to be a really nice guy or nice woman or whatever, and you have this creepy feeling, he's always right. You know, it's like a horses and dogs. It's, you know, it's an interesting thing. But well, that's, I think women all have, you know, there's always, I guess Michelle Obama says, you know, when you're standing at the water cooler and some guy sort of standing <coughs> a little too close or staring a little too long, you know, it's, if you feel that doesn't feel right for you, it's probably not right, so just get it. You know. Well, you had that happen to me when the murals guy sat down right next behind you, you know, looking at your ass. And uh, <laughs> you got up and you stood behind so, him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was on the ladder, you know. And so he's right there, and he just was a, he just felt creepy. And he wasn't a college, he was older than a college student. I was at SUNY Oneonta. So I thought, what the hell? So I got down off the ladder, and I stood behind him, because he was at a, on a couch watching. You know, what, six to eight feet away, and I just stood behind him until he left. <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't feel afraid because I wasn't alone because there were lots of other people in the building. And I thought, what's, you know, come on, give me a break. You are, it was creepy. And I just, you know, I honored that, that I felt that, and he left, you know. So maybe he was fine. Maybe some other person was fine. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. we should probably yep. carry on. <laughs> carry on. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Other? Yes, please. I guess you talk about like what the process of like learning how to take an abortion is like. Like, how do you pursue that? Is that something all women learn? 
is it difficult to define for the teacher? The question. That's a great question, yeah. Um, the question is uh, the process of learning working <coughs> and how that is. In New York City, it's uh, we mandated that, it, that um, all OBGYN residency programs uh, teach it, and I think you can opt out, but um, and only a very small, like I think it's 500 or maybe a thousand out of uh, 50,000 OBGYNs do more than 400 abortions a year. So it's a very, very small group for many, many reasons. Um, and it is difficult to get training. Um, but if you, for instance, decide you're going to be an obstetrician gynecologist, in some states a nurse practitioner uh, can do that as well. Um, you just have to find a program where the way it's offered, and you have to make that a criterion on, on which you do it. Now, for me, um, I learned a little bit during residency, and then I did about 10 abortions a year for 30 years or less. And once I was certified as such, there was no way I could get hands on experience at another institution. So that becomes difficult. So I went to eight or so different clinics, and I watched. And I've been a surgeon, and I just started doing them. And um, there's a learning curve. I'd say the first thousand. What happened was that every single day, where we did 16 or so, there was one that was that I had to really think about and be challenged by. And then what I did, and what most doctors do with later abortions, is on my own, little by little by little by little, I, keep, I went later and later. And the technique at 12 weeks changes from the suction to, well, 12, 14 weeks it changes and to suction to what's called a DME or dilation and extraction, where you actually have to use forceps to pull out the fetus. And it's difficult. And it's difficult emotionally, uh, I mean, it was for me, but it, and it's difficult technically. Um, but that was the only way I could learn. And generally speaking, most doctors sort of who do abortions, who decide to go later, just sort of gently and slowly go a little later. But and she's asking, you know, if she, for a training program, could you ask how late would, could I be taught to do abortions to 12 weeks, or could I go up to 12? I mean, can you ask that kind of question in an interview? Of course, she, yes. Yeah. I mean, you, you can. Have to do that I mean, you can ask, can I, is it part of the training <coughs> or late? Can you teach it? Usually, actually, the later abortions are taught in fellowship, <coughs> which is after right after medical school, after residency, so four years, four years, and then a fellowship. Um, but it is a challenge. Long and easy. Would it be great to have more women? And there are. There are. Yeah. 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 Um, based on the current state of our country, how do you how do you see um, the field for like our generation, who our generation is going to be around like in the future, like first those of us who want to be in that field someday. How do you think that would be different? Based on the, um, I'm going to make sure I get the question right. Based on the way the country is, how will it be for women who want to be OBGYN in the future? Yeah, like how do you see it? I think, I think that, I think actually that it would be okay um, as long as you have access to birth control. I mean, and if you're gay, then you have a choice, right? I mean, generally speaking, you have a choice whether to have a child or not. Gay sex. Is she? Like the individual. No, no, I'm just student. I'm not saying you, but no, I'm no, just no, saying but one. Yeah. But I think that I think actually the women women will continue to dominate. Um, dominate is a bad word. I apologize, I don't mean that in a sense, in a negative sense, but we'll, um, we'll, 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 we'll populate the, the uh, uh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, because when Mark was the medical team, it was one, out of a one woman out of a hundred men. Yeah. So now it's more 50-50. Yeah, so and it will better. be. I don't think that's an issue, honestly, because women do well academically, and unlike you, um, where you were discriminated against in science horribly. Um, I think it's going to stay okay for as long as you, you know. The trouble, of course, is federal funding. 
that's the part of that's the issue. But if that's people are going to have babies, so there will and need abortion, so there will well, we don't know what's going to happen with abortion. I, mean, I don't think it's what I want to say is it's not hopeless, and I think that if that's an interest, do it, and you will succeed, and you will if you have passion for that, you will succeed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a matter of passion. You know, it's a matter of. Yeah. And it sounds and like, you know, four years of money, four years of OBGYN. One day. Residence. Yeah, you just, one day at a time. It's an adventure. I mean, I didn't do it, but I just observed it. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't it's easy adventure. for us. It's not easy, but what, you know, what else would you be doing? You know what I mean? It's like, if you want to do that, go for it. <coughs> other, other questions? Anything else? Okay. Um, Sarah, I can ask one too. Yeah. I remember Dr. Helly, you talking last semester about the deep emotional labor that's involved in providing abortion. That I, part of the reason that you retired, it sounded like, was because it was it's oh. deeply emotional work that you're doing. The the listening, the yeah. therapeutic aspects of it. So maybe say something about that. Yeah, you know I am. Um, I got technically good at, um, after you know, 12 years of doing abortion. But to me, at least half the work was making an emotional connection. The, the feminists of the 70s and 80s taught me that you, as a male gynecologist, you do not take care of a woman when she's in church. You meet them, I insist, they are dressed, you shake their hand, you say hello, right? That's just manners. And in the process of doing that, I would um, make a connection um, or really work hard to make a connection. It doesn't take long for somebody to perceive whether or not you care about them. And so I would introduce myself and say, I'm Dr. Heller, and I'm going to take good care of you today. And do you have any questions? And that, you know, was it. But that. Being emotionally present was half the work, and and I when I noticed I had a patient that had been abused from when she was five to when she was seventeen. Um, she would lost her house. She and her husband was they both lost their job. It was a terrible tragedy, and all I remember this. All I did that day was I came in put my hand on her arm, and I said, we'll take good care of you. That's all I did. And the nurses were fine, because we had a real. And, and I thought, uh, not the way I didn't practice. I'm done. I have to stop. And I'm too tired. It's not that I was unkind, but I could, I could no longer have, expend that energy to connect. Because you get so much more back um, when you connect with any, any, in any relationship anyway, but it takes um, it's hard. I mean, it takes work, right? It takes, um, and it was so important to me to um, convey a sense of respect. Because I had patients, you know, who were sexually abused, and um, I would share the fact that when I was 12, a bus driver took me down a back alley, and of course, that, you know, women might feel a lot worse, but it did explain that I understood what it's like to feel helpless, you know. And women with depression um, who, who felt that their depression would be worse, if they had this baby, I would explain, yes, and I understand that, and because I've had uh, depression my entire life, and I've had to struggle with it, and I wouldn't want to have anything happen to me to make it worse, because I know what that darkness feels like. And some people will say, well, you're sharing too much, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, that's partly what this is about. And as a, as a professional, you have to decide are you doing it for yourself or for the patient. And I, I think that, you know, the anxiety level will go, shh, right down. You know, I'm not going to judge you. I'm just another person doing the best I can is to call my patients fellow travelers. You know, there's a different genetic element. People, right? And, um, doing our best. Sometimes screwing up. We may have 
<laughs> well, I just think of how we were at your age and think, my God, people today seem so mature and have a lot together, but I said, it's hard to grow up. And I think the decade between the 20, 20 and 30 is really hard. Our daughter just turned 30. That's great. It's a huge milestone, but <clears throat> there's a lot you have to do. You know, finding partners, finding your work, finding a place to live, you know, finding the city you want to get. It's just huge. So, you know, if you get discouraged, and it is, it's very tough. It's a tough time, but um, you can do it, definitely. And, you know, a group this size can make such a difference. If every one of you vote, you know, if, if two or three of you uh, run for office, if two or three of you or more become uh, um, physicians or OBGYNs, um, you, you could change incredible, make incredible changes uh, in this shitty uh, situation that we're in right now. Um, and with you studying suffrage, you know, women unfortunately have been through this and through this and through this suffrage. And it's just one of those times when you have to fight. And what I saw with the suffrage, they, there was backsliding because it took 70 years for <coughs> to get the vote, they were, you know, people lost, they lost, got the vote, but some states had lost it. So it's just a matter of you, you just keep going, you know, and you don't get discouraged. Ultimately, well, you do get discouraged. You do get discouraged, but not like so much that you won't carry on, you know, and just you, keep on going. And you really make the if you figure thirty eight percent of the people who are eligible to vote vote in the last midterm election, and you and you vote every single one of you vote. These elections are close, you know. And some, and if somebody's an asshole and they and they have no competition and, and you lose, they still have competition, you know. Somebody's going to hold them to task. And right. And what he's saying is that if you're running against somebody, because they were saying that even running against an incumbent is really important because you're starting to ask them questions and they have to sort of, you know, be, um, they have to answer to people. Whereas if they just get both. You know, they have no competition, they get supported <coughs> in again, that's not so good. But even if you run and you don't win, that's still better than, a lot better than not. Anyway, and then there's a, she has a, that has a, a list that's mm -hmm. available. Do we have one more question or? We have time for a couple more. Oh, yeah. good. okay. So, you know, and also you don't have to just ask positive questions. You can ask negative questions and yeah, say, yeah. you know, well, I, I don't know. understand how you could do that or I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. With it. There's no violence in this room. We're still learning, right? So you, you don't have to be enlightened. Yeah, because the other day somebody, um, I put up a couple of images of the suffragists, and somebody from your generation said, um, oh, suffragists were racist as fuck. And I thought, wow, that's a really good question. So I can answer that woman, like with, you know, the history. To sort of flesh out the history. Not to, and not so, to justify it. Not to, I, I don't want to be a shill for the suffragists, but explain, you know, how how it, you know, they were first abolitionists, then they were suffragists, and you know, so somebody who's an abolitionist was helping to get to um, get rid of slavery. So you can't really say they were but the, racist completely. Is, Maybe a little bit. There is great. I mean, these are uh, difficult. Um, this is difficult stuff. It, you know, human life is precious to things that women's lives are precious, right? It's true. You're ending potential human life. I never <coughs> thought of it as tissue. Never. But, you know, potential, present life takes precedence over potential life. That's, that's, you saw that, there was a movie you just saw, I guess, about the provider for some of you. Um, so that's what I felt, and I felt that way because of the stories, and because of my own stories and the struggles, and our struggles, um, and uh, and the complexity of, of just how hard it can be. Um, I live with ambiguity. <laughs> it's so deep. I think that's Democrats. We all see every shade of. Well, I think it's not such a Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but you know, it's not yes. black and white.
Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the expansion of trans health care under Planned Parenthood and that that includes abortions, that there may be people who, um, trans men receiving abortions or people who do not identify on the gender spectrum receiving abortions and what that, if you've encountered what that looks like, what the growing education around for gynecologists looks like around abortion and trans health care. My experience with trans health was very limited, um, not because I wanted it to be. What happened was that about a year before I retired, Planned Parenthood had a protocol for hormone therapy for trans <coughs> people. Um, but the logistics, you just couldn't get the logistics done in time. So I didn't have a, a large, um, I don't, don't have enough knowledge. I don't have much knowledge. I mean, my only experience was in the early 80s where I was referred this um, trans woman who um, she was getting her hormones on the street. She was she had AIDS. And this, uh, this guy, um, oncologist, uh, referred her to me in the early 80s. And she came and, and told me the list of hormones that she wanted. I didn't examine her or even take her blood pressure, and I just, well, if she wants to live the rest of her life as a woman, then she deserves that. And it took about five years I did that. But I really must say that I was sort of on the cusp of that, unfortunately. So I'm sorry, I can't speak intelligently about it. Not, not on the cusp of people for trans people, but on the cusp of people where I could take care of them. <coughs> this, I hope you got something that you needed from her that was useful to you. I can't tell you how important it is to me to be able to speak to you. ones that have the power and will have the power. <coughs> and I really, I believe that and uh, it means a lot to me to be able to have this opportunity to be, to, to be here with you. So. Do you want to say what those 12 years of Planned Parenthood were like in comparison to the other years? Sure, the, I'll tell you what they were like. I think some people may have Experience Planned Parenthood, some have not. What is it like in that space? Well, and working with that team. Yeah, the, the, well, I, I, there were a couple of differences. One is that I supervised 26 nurse practitioners and stuff, and they did general, the 20,000 patients a year that we took care of, and I did mainly the abortion part. But there were a number of things. One is that um, one becomes professionally isolated. So that if I have a complication, which I rarely do, but I did, there's nobody, no doctor within a hundred miles at least who could really mean to help me. Um, so the other was, am I answering what you're getting at or not? What am I, what am I, where am I going with this? I remember you talking about the team approach in Planned Parenthood and how you worked with a team. Oh, yeah. Interdisciplinary team. I know you also traveled around the region. And yeah, that mainly, was that was an isolating process. Yeah, but. mainly. Um, oh, we had such a great team. We had uh, oh, we had counselors who were really nice people, and then there was the nurses in the um, in the prep area. And, you know, everybody had their job. Whereas before, I did surgery and abortions and stuff, and I sort of did everything. It was so much better, better care with with the team. People. And then I worked with two women, and especially on the late transition things, it was sort of like a, a dance because there are things as a woman that they could do that I couldn't do and wouldn't do. For instance, you know, they'd say, oh, you're funny, you have such beautiful eyelashes, or they stroke their hair, or they rub their leg, or, you know, so that it was, it was really great to, to be, to have that sort of. Uh, combination of people where, you, where something that as a man would be completely inappropriate, but as a woman to woman, you know, where would you get that tattoo?
coo, or you have such beautiful eyes, sweetie, or whatever. It's that sort of thing where women, where they could help, you know, where they could decompress the situation in ways that I couldn't. And um, that's something I really miss. Because these were like family. But you also said that you would, I mean, you, you didn't really have to talk. You each had your job. And you well, they gave me a lot of shit. But when things were, when <coughs> things went wrong, I mean, behind, not in front of the patients, but behind, you know, the scenes, there was a lot of humor on, on not at patients' expense, but at, usually at each other's expense. And this survival humor, you know, get your ass in here, that sort of thing. But when things went wrong, we had each other's back as a team. It was almost like we didn't have to say it. Somebody was hemorrhaging, you know, it was, it was like this person did this, this person did that. Um, and it was, uh, if any of you have worked in under adverse conditions with a group of people, or you've worked really hard with people like, like fellow students when you're on a really hard course and you're working together. It's like, you know, you might meet up in 10 years and like, boom, you start up again, you know. Um, you have your experience. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I know, Christine, you talked last time about raising kids in the context of threats. Oh, yeah. You know, death threats and all sorts of things. And it was something that we had, I mean, when Mark left, those two days when he went up to Planned Parenthood and we were constrained to where we'd always, I'd always say drive carefully, which is the euphemism for be careful, you know, look around, watch if there's anybody behind you, you know, and one didn't know if we you know if he would come back, but I just put it out of my mind. Our kids, um, <clears throat> they, it scared them, you know, what Mark did. And, um, I said there was a day, bring your child, daughter to work day and I asked my daughter, I said, Rachel, would you like to come? And she said, no, Dad, I don't want to have anything to do with your work. Your work scares me. And then one day, Sam, my son, who was about eight, he said, Dad, are you safe? And I said, yes. Honestly, I'm not safe. I felt like I should have said more, but I didn't. So, um, yeah, and it was, I mean, there were some social situations. Mark was talking about being isolated. Like, once we were in the health food store in Hoopertown, and a woman who's the parent of one of our daughter's friends, she came running to Mark and screaming at him about doing abortions. And um, we quickly left, but it was like, wow, we can't even go to the health food store, you know? And, um, and then we were at a, I had a show in Hudson, and Mark, went, okay, I'm the, Safe and it's open, you know, it's artists, it's, you know, but there was, the, there were two women there who were arguing about abortion, and you felt like... Well, one woman said it's nothing, it's a routine procedure. Well, I mean, for some women, yes, it's, it's routine, and then another started yelling at me about partial birth abortion, which is not the correct term, it's a whole other topic unto itself, but... But do you think it's really routine for any woman? I mean, I didn't pregnant, find it so. Yeah, I mean, if but you, I wasn't, and, and we had patients write for little parts if they wanted to, um, stories about for other women about, you know, encouragement, sometimes they cry. I think it is hard. A lot of people were crying, um, but I think part of it is cultural because I went to I went to Amsterdam. Saw 50 late abortions, late abortions. In Holland. In Holland. In Holland. And um, one woman is first. So uh, it, it depends on the culture and what people you know, take in. But I think that you know, one in three of you statistically is going to get an abortion at some point in time. <laughs> that shame is not a useful emotion um, and it's not you do the best you can at the time and you know we all do the best we can we're no different that way right we're still working on doing our best <laughs> we put a lot over the people 
So there were, I mean, there were, and there was a really nasty letter in the um, paper, the little round tab, it's sort of the local paper, but I happened to be working on gun control at the time, it was around 2000, and the year 2000, and um, so I, as the president of our local chapter, the Brady campaign, um, I, I would write letters to the editor, we would talk, but we went to workshops in Washington, learning how to deal, and so I wrote a you know, my, every month I'd write a little editorial saying, you know, we're doing really well. Um, the local supermarket's giving us gun locks and we're keeping kids safe. That was our mantra, keep kids safe. Well, this woman who was a notorious anti-abortionist who knew Mark and his work, she wrote a letter to the editor saying, I don't understand why Mrs. Heller worries so much about children dying from gun violence when she's married to the notorious abortionist baby killer, Dr. Heller. And it was like, really, lady? Um, you know, and it was it was scary because then it was like Mark was outed, you know, because we always thought, oh, nobody really knows what Mark does. This is when he was still at Bassett Hospital in Cooperstown. And it was like, oh, my God, everybody knows, you know, what Mark does. I mean, she knew. She had known for years, this nasty woman. But, and then my you know, that was stressful. My secretary lived in a, lived in a house um, about 10 miles from our house. It was next to a fundamentalist church, and the preacher preached that, well, you know, some of you feel it's okay to go into uh, abortion clinics and kill doctors, uh, and that's okay with us, you know, uh, and that's like 10 miles from our house, so, and Operation Rescue was right down the road, which was an organization that was um, pretty violent, um, and that letter <coughs> was written right after the Dr. Slepin, who was the doctor in Butler that was shot, was killed, and the, the guy who did it said he was going to go out and shoot doctors and his staff across the country. And right after she wrote that, and he called the editor and said, you know, you're threatening my husband's life. He said, oh, you know, we write, we, we cover for all those things. Well, so, that can't be true. Sure. That absolutely can't be true. So, um, well, you know, there's a lot, but on the other hand, it's, it's, it's a, again, you, you get to know people's stories and, and the fact that they suffer and, and that they, and maybe they just want to, don't want to kill the baby, you know, maybe they just, I had a, one of the turning points. Oh, you go. So just like they, having a baby, oh my God, it's massive, it's huge to have a baby. It's like, it's, it's wonderful. It's a huge adventure, but you want to be friends too, because it's a big, big responsibility and job, and um, it's wonderful. But you don't want to do it when you're not married. The, the the turning point in my career about multiple abortions was when I was re really quite young. I guess you know, 1980, a lot younger than now. But I was, and there was this actress who came in, and she was about my age, and she came. She was maybe. 30-ish, and I was about 30-ish, and she said, uh, she came for her third abortion, and I hadn't, I didn't know much about this at that time, I said, you know, three abortions, that's a lot, and she looked at me, and she said, Dr. Heller, she said, I've been having sex for 15 years, she said, I mean, I've had a lot of great sex, and she said, I think I'm doing pretty well, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> Am I going to begrudge this woman of 15 years of really great sex? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when I'm working 80 hours a week. And, uh, and <laughs> 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 I was really jealous. basically just 
I did, I did abortions and I didn't speak out. Is that what you're? Your yeah. Question? Yeah, and I really didn't. And there. Was that conflicting <coughs> to you at the time, or did you just, was that conflicting to you at the time, or did you know that you were, you just had to make that decision? No, it wasn't the kind of constant. I just I had to sort of the priority was continuing to do the work right. and being as safe as I could be. Right. Yeah. You know, and then trying to let it go. You know, I'm just because I I. I really wanted to do this kind of work. I never thought I would wind up that way. So no, I would I would never be standing here. Um, and I, I just and there were colleagues of mine who didn't who were in group practices that did abortions. You know, when they weren't in the group practices, but didn't even shut their colleagues down. There were colleagues of mine who didn't even let their family know. Uh, did you find there was a difference between abortions for just generally unknown <coughs> pregnancies and those that were being terminated after seeing like a genetic counselor or someone that was telling them that they would maybe have a certain defect when they were born? That's a really good question, yeah. The question was, um, was there a difference between people who were having abortions because they weren't ready to have a pregnancy and people who had a wanted pregnancy and had a, had a baby with a child, a birth defect? Yeah, there was a I mean, yes, there was a difference, although there was sadness on both sides, you know. Um, I always said that it's, it's, difficult, it's as hard for a woman who is who wants to be pregnant, who can't get pregnant, as a woman who um, doesn't want to get pregnant, but who does. Um, yeah, one of the... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't think how best to answer that. Oh, yeah. I think that the real, the honest answer is that it's a, you have a little bit of somebody's life and you see them suffering or not, but you never really know whole story and so even the people that I really got to know who I really missed were patients that I saw over the 30 years as you just said and those were by and large not people that I had abortions on very few and those people I knew I mean those people were like when I retired this patient at night in retirement party she said you know talk, talking to Mark was like talking to my own best girlfriend <laughs> So, but I really liked, you know, that was, that was a big reflection. So, to shorten my answer, the answer is I don't, I think it was very different, but I don't, I couldn't, I didn't counsel them for long enough to know how, how, what that difference really was for them. Of course, you don't really know whether another person really feels any way. Just one because we believe that why do you let Mark do abortions? And I'm saying, can we get that Mark? Because a lot of um, spouses would say, you're not doing abortions because you're an OBGYN um, abortion provider of spouses. And I just thought, you know, Mark is who he is. He makes his choices. This is part of who he is. And I, I mean, if I can't take it, then it's, it's not really my place to say to him not to do it. And I always felt if I can't, and then I need to get out. But at least I'm not going to tell him to not do abortions. I mean, it's his life. Also, you had one and we had, had one. So had one how can I, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it seems only fair to so do what I Giving back is part of it, too. People have different relationships, obviously. I'm not judging their other people's relationships because people are different to is there one last question, maybe? Yeah, there is. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about how it was a very stressful time and your whole focus and working on yourself. Could you talk about like, what your self care practice was and how you took care of yourself? Mm -hmm. It's about self. It's a great question. It's about self. <coughs> um, well, okay. Um, let's see. I 
um, tried to get like an exercise. I uh, tried to I, I um, did the appropriate measures for managing my depression. Um, I uh, which varied because uh, it's just probably up and down to the point. Um, I think we supported each other, or you supported me. Yeah, I mean, we used to go out in the woods on the weekend, and you know, with Mark with the chainsaw, and just it just felt like it was away from the phone, and, and it was you know beautiful outside. And, and then also when Mark came home from work, it was usually after dinner, the kids and I would eat, and he would just start reading to the kids because it was close to their bedtime, and that seemed to be give you a lot of pleasure. The other thing was, I mean, it was only once a year, but once a year, getting together with 300 or 400 uh, abortion providers and staff was just amazing. And it was the one time in the year that I didn't feel really sort of alone. And the, I guess the other thing is that self-care was um, being with the staff who took care of each other, who looked after each other. Uh, you know, yeah. you, um, I mean, I wasn't always good at it, I must say. Um, I, I was a recovering alcoholic, so I, I was, I stuck with it three decades ago. So I chose bad drugs for a long time. Well, not a long time. So I learned that way not, not to you know, not to do that. And that was well before I was doing abortion. I guess I've always had to do some sort it's never for me, um, self care has never been straightforward. And so I think that for me, um, I have an empathy, I guess, for those people for whom self care is not to be accomplished. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's difficult to do self care in the I think. It's a great question. It's great. I think it's something that um, when our daughter was in high school, that I mean, everybody was pushed to work so hard. There was no question about self care. It was, so I'm hearing it's great to hear yeah, that question because it means that it's in the, that you guys are talking about that. Yeah, it's really important, isn't it? It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, regardless of the stresses, I think it's a big deal. Luckily, now there's you know alternatives that are more right, like yoga and meditation, and that sort of stuff can certainly I find helpful. But um, getting in the woods, getting exercise, doing something completely different. And also, you know what? I tend to think out loud, but I think that um, um, you got to really get a lot back. And almost basically everybody said thank you. And every single person that I did an abortion on practice with who said thank you. And that goes a long way. It's not self care, but for feeling like. In your heart, you know, that you're, that you're okay. <coughs> now, quite a difference from. It's not that people weren't grateful in my regular patch, but there was a, a real. I mean, they didn't always look me in the eye on the way out. I mean, they weren't out, but they just said thank you. And that's an experience that a lot of abortion providers have. It's, it's a serious strike. So that's. I would think of that. Well, thank you so much for being here.